we are keeping a certain part of love on lock, and that is selflessness and seasons. Everyone say seasons. But before we jump into uh, this message, I just want to remind you the reason why we're doing a relationship series. First of all, we do it every year, but also it's because the word that we've been given this year, which we've always been pursuing, but we've declared it this year, that we are a church that we understand that we are the kingdom. It's men and women serving God together, expanding the kingdom. We are an army of God, and we are called to advance his kingdom. And if relationships build the kingdom of God, then we've got to love well. And we've got to get our love locked down, love locked down. That's me all week. You know what else was in my head? There is a season turn. turn. I think I'm singing the harmony. I don't know how it goes. 70s music, anybody? I, there's, turn, 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 there is a season. Thank you, Jen. Yes, okay, very good. All right, no one? Okay, all right. There, there was an emphatic no over there. Okay, it's great. But hey, we've got to build the kingdom of God. And that happens and comes by way of recognizing that relationships, when we love well, when we love our spouses well, when we love our children well, when we love strangers well, when we love the church well, when we love as Christ loves, the kingdom of God advances. We are called to be the kingdom builders, and that is our mission to advance the kingdom. So this week, we're talking about selflessness and seasons unlock. Um, next week, we'll talk about leadership and love unlock. The following week, trauma and triggers. And Caleb and I, we actually are looking forward to speaking together. So make sure you come for that. But when I thought about seasons, I thought about all the different seasons of life that I've gone through. I had a, um, a tomboy season. I had an obsessed with Michael Jordan season. I had, oh, makeup season. And then I had, um, oh, friends season, lonely season, um, on fire for the Lord, ooh, struggled a bit, bit season. And then I had a marriage season, children season, all of your lives. You can think about all throughout your life, the different seasons that have come and gone, right? In fact, it's inevitable that we experience seasons and you know, I think when we don't understand what season that we are in, we start running into troubles with our relationships. When we are not understanding what God is wanting us to see in the season that is an inevitable and the season that is provided, then we run into issues. Think about your relationships. Oftentimes, relationships go awry when somebody isn't getting what they want, right? relationships run into problems when people are not being fulfilled, when expectations aren't being met. And here's the thing, seasons change every, every what, for every three months, every four months. Certain places like San Diego, whew, they have a long, beautiful season of sun, right? But then they do have June gloom, okay? We did not know that last year when we went on our vacation. It was, it was awful. So when you go somewhere expecting to get sun and you don't realize what season is set for that place, then you get into problems. And I, I want us to understand that seasons are so important because they are ever-changing and they are inevitable. Sometimes we run into issues when we don't want the seasons to change, when we can't identify that there is a necessary ending that there is a necessary rebirth, that there is something to be accomplished in this season, but when we're just wait, wanting for the past or wanting for the future, then we run into issues. That's when expectations are met. So it's so important that we understand where, what seasons are. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8, I'm gonna read it through it really quickly because this is how important seasons are to God. In fact, he provided it for us. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, 
a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. If there is a person who is obsessed with only wanting to have a certain time and not recognizing that there's a season for that time to end, then we are gonna be sorely disappointed. I want you to think about seasons in relationships. I know I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but oftentimes relationships take on um, honeymoon seasons, right? It's when everything is sweet like honey, right? Um, and I don't think that this is just for uh, romantic relationships. This happens in platonic relationships, even in the relationships you have with your workplace. But there's a honeymoon season. It's sweet. It's wonderful. And then the next season is this reality of reality, <laughs> disillusionment phase. This is where we get a little bit let down, a little disappointed. And the reality is that things aren't perfect and they're not always going to be sweet. So when I think about that, you taste a little bit of bitterness. It doesn't taste as good. But when you make it past the disillusionment phase, and I truly believe if you can survive disillusionment, even disillusionment in your relationship with God, when you realize um, what your faith really is all about, who God really is, when you can make it past unmet expectations, you realize that you can thrive in the third phase, and that's commitment. Commitment. And when I think about commitment in relationships, you taste the sweet and the bad and you're okay with both. You're content with both, you're satisfied. So that, that, those are some typical you know, seasons in relationships. But also there's a parenting relationship and I, something that I wanna bring up and I, we've talked about it for years, but I don't know that we have recently, but with, when it comes to parenting, there's certain seasons in disciplining our children um, and raising them up. So from ages zero through five, we believe that's a little bit more of the discipline season. This is where if you believe in spanking, then this is where you spank or this is where you identify a little bit more direct um, correction and discipline if not spanking. And then ages six through 11, you're training them in the truths that they need to learn and the things that you've disciplined them in. And then ages 12 through 17, this is where you as a parent become the motivator. This is where you encourage them and you cheer them on and you coach them in the things that you've already trained them in. So you know that you've given them the tools, so now you coach them in those. And then by the time the kids reach 18 and up, you can experience the season of friendship. I know that I've experienced this with my family, Caleb. You know, with his family, he experienced uh, friendship with them about 19 years old. And for me, with my Asian parents, it hit about 39 years old. So um, I think some of you guys get that. <laughs> but here's what happens. Mom, dad, I know you're watching. Love you so much. Okay. Um, <laughs> so parenting, here's what's hap what happens. A lot of times we want friendship early on in our parenting relationship. And I've seen this happen. I think I even had the temptation of like, oh, I just want them to be my buddy. I do take Charlie on um, nail appointments with me. And it's like, oh, I have my friend who I can do this with. But here's what happens. If we try to make them our best friends from zero to 11, we kind of miss out on the discipline and the training. By the time they get to uh, the coaching season where you coach them and what you've trained them and disciplined in them, then you're like, we missed something. And, and we've missed the coaching set. We've missed the discipline and the training set. So then when you get to the coaching season of 12 through 17, which is why I think that some teenage years are hard, it doesn't have to be. I don't think we need to speak that over our parenting. I think that we have a, we're new creatures, we're new creations, we understand seasons. So when we can approach what is called hard in culture, if we approach and understand what God is trying to accomplish in a season, then we'll do things like discipline and wait for friendship until 18 and after. But some people are trying to spank their kids when they're 12 through 17. And you should have been doing that when they were zero to five. And maybe not spanking, maybe disciplining them and training them in some of these areas. And so we fall into problems when we don't realize what season we're in. Our relationships will falter when we don't realize what season we're in. I think about even our church. For a long time, um, we were a church of a bunch of young adults. And it was bizarre to me and Caleb because Caleb and I were like, 
we're a young family, so we want all these young families to come with all their kids. And then it was like all these single people with no kids coming and hanging out. It was awesome. And then what did we do? We leaned into it. And I remember I see Jason back there with Danielle. They were single at the time, but when he was leading a community group, it was like all the young people, there were like 60 strong at times, and the thriving groups were like young people, right? It was awesome. But if we had said, no, we're not gonna serve them, um, we're just gonna serve the people that look like us and what we want when we want it, because this is what our goal is, then we would have totally missed what God was doing. And I see some young adults who are now married and having kids in our family, church family now. It's amazing, right? But if we didn't lean in then, what, what would have been our church then? So I, I think about church, there are seasons where we were expanding, there were seasons where we were just improving, Seasons where we were refueling. Actually, right now, we're experiencing expansion. You guys can get it because it's a little warm in here because it's crowded, right? Lots of seats are filled, right? And we've been experiencing record numbers week after week. So it's awesome, great expansion. But we do believe that this has happened as a result of about a year, a year and a half of improving. We improve some of our systems internally that you guys will never see, our human resources department and developing our staff and growing and personally as leaders and having an executive coach help us. I mean, these improving seasons are important before we go into the expansion season. I want you to think about this not just for church, but for your businesses. If you don't realize what season you're in and you're only longing for expansion, then you will not be refueling or improving and God wants you to refuel and improve so that you can be healthy in the expansion. But some businesses, some organizations, some churches, we expand without the improving and the refueling and their leaders are burnt out and unhealthy. But we need to understand the season if we want the fullness of what God has for us, if we want the fullness of health in every season. We gotta understand what God is doing. And Galatians 6, 9, do not grow weary in doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up, if we focus on what God has for every season, then we'll get the fullness of who he is. We'll get to that commitment stage where we feel satisfied. So I'm reminded of uh, my mentor in college. She talks about the idea of a Chinese buffet in America versus a Chinese banquet. I think some of us Americans are living in a buffet-style life, understanding that we can get whatever we want, when we want it, for the least amount of money. And sometimes the food is trash. But if it satisfies us in the moment, we'll grab it. We'll get our salad and we'll slop it on our plates. We'll get whatever we want, when we want it, all you can eat, right? We love the buffets. I actually don't, but I know some of us do. But (laughs) when you really think about this fast option, and then you think, my, my mentor, she spent some time in China and she experienced a, a banquet in China. And what is amazing is that unlike the restaurants, when we order soup and salad, you know the soup is already pre-made and they just slop it on and it was pre-made a long time ago, right? But for, for a Chinese banquet, there's not even a main course. There's just courses. Americans, we, we say, We want the main course, and we look forward to just that when we want it, when we can get it, after we get all these little things that aren't important. But no, 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 a Chinese banquet, the appetizer or the first course is beautifully decadent. It's it's, it's just very, it has all the stuff that we get in America at the, on the entree, right? The dessert is beautiful. The courses, they're all beautifully coming together. And so every plate, you're like, wow, this is beautiful. This was created specifically by the master chef. Every single thing. It wasn't like the waitress threw a salad on a plate and grabbed a bunch of soup and threw a bowl over at me. Every single course, very specific and very beautifully designed. 
And that's how God has designed every season of our life. He doesn't just slop things on your life zero to, you know, throughout your teenage years. He doesn't just say, oh, the single years, that's just kind of the, the soup. That's the meal before the main course for some of us who are thinking that the main course is marriage. No, we have to start seeing it the way God created a Chinese banquet. We have a God who created, he's the master chef and every single season is very specific and his hand is on it all. It's, the appetizer and the dessert isn't an afterthought. He's not just focused on one main course. Every single course is for you and specifically designed for you. Isn't that amazing? I, I want you to think about the seasons of your life perhaps that you have wasted because it wasn't the main course. Every season, that the seasons that feel like they're empty, the seasons that feel like things are dying, the things that are like, woo, new love and the novelty of the spring season. Listen, those are all specifically from God and we want to get the fullness of what he's doing in those seasons so we can be satisfied in those seasons. But I'm afraid we're going from season to season unsatisfied because we want what we only want. And it's truly selfishness. So if we want to truly make it in this, this life of kingdom building relationships, then selflessness is a secret sauce to succeed in every season. There's a secret sauce to a lot of things. And when I think about making it through every season, the ups and downs, the ebbing and the flowing, it's selflessness that's going to help us make it through every season. Relationships build a kingdom of God, but selfish People trying to build relationships are actually just building a destructive kingdom. And that actually is the areas where there's unhealth. That's where there's deterioration. But we want to be a church. We want to be a, we want to be a kingdom that is healthy, that is understanding that God has something specific for us every season. I think about the season that I was single. Was there a want for Marriage, yes. Was there a want for kids? Yes. But my single season, that was when I gave it all fully devoted to God. That's why I had a little bit more time to serve. Do I still serve at a great capacity? Yes, but I now serve not just the church. I serve not just my mom and dad. I serve my husband. I serve my kids. That What I think we need to understand that in every season, if we start serving, then we will, we will keep ourselves from growing selfish. So selfishness is the secret sauce to make it through every season of our relationships, every season of life, even every season that we have with God. When we can align with him, when we can align with his purposes, then we will succeed. So I want to jump us to Colossians 3, 1 through 5, and I'm going to jump all the way to verse 17, but we're going to stay mostly in Colossians 3, 1 through 5. And my points today are about keeping seasons on lock and what it requires. So you ready to understand our seasons and how we can stay selfless? Everybody say, stay selfless. Stay selfless, Sacramento. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I will not tell you the reference to that. All right. Keeping seasons on lock require, number one, a kingdom mindset. A kingdom mindset. Let's read it, Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things, for you have died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. If we're going to keep our seasons on lock with selflessness, we have to be, number one, kingdom-minded. Keep a kingdom mindset. Set your, things, your mind on things above and not on earthly things. For you have died and your life is now hidden. When I think about hiddenness, I think about the people who desire to be humble. When you want to be hidden, then you want to be keep yourself humble. You don't want to show everybody who you are, what you are. You're not about yourself. So hiddenness is important. But what I want you to remember about hiddenness with Jesus's life is that really 30 years of his life was lived in obscurity. 
and hiddenness. We didn't know much about his life. Think about what you read in the word. But what we do see is three years of powerful ministry of Jesus, and that only was made by way of being hidden. Because in hiddenness, that's where your character is developed. In hiddenness, that's where your ambitions are refined. In hiddenness, you are not tempted, and you are, you're not, well, you're tempted in hiddenness, but um, you don't make the same mistakes publicly you have an opportunity to make mistakes privately. I'm not saying that you're gonna be perfect by the time you are you know, revealed, but there, there is a blessing in hiddenness. There's a blessing in, in the season of hiddenness. But what I want you to focus here about a kingdom mindset is to set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. When your relationships are struggling, perhaps it's because you are fighting for the wrong thing. I know they said this a couple couple weeks ago in our message on communication, but I need us to understand that sometimes things fall apart when our minds are only on our problems. When we're focused, oh, I feel bad for the relationships and the, 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 the things that are breaking down because of earthly things, because of finances, because of lust, because of all the things of this earth that are distracting us from being heavenly minded. God wants to build his kingdom through you. So if you are trying to make it in your relationship without keeping your eyes on Jesus, your relationships are sure to be destroyed. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things for you have died and your life is now hidden. We're hidden in Christ. We want him to be our shield from the things of this world. We want to be hidden in him. We are a new creation to him. When we have died and our life is now hidden in him, we want to approach everything with Jesus as our filter. We want to approach everything with how would Jesus respond. We want to approach everything with what is this happening in my marriage in light of the kingdom? Why? What is this going to do to my family if I don't heal my marriage in light of the kingdom? What is this going to do to the next generation if I conduct my Myself this way? What is this going to do to the people in my workplace that I have leadership over if I don't do things the way Jesus would? Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. We need to be focused on our kingdom. The relationships that you are building are meant to advance the kingdom. You are kingdom builders. Are you advancing the kingdom? with your words, in your deeds? Do you have your kingdom mindset on lock? If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Do you wanna be kingdom minded? Stay in the presence of God. The presence of God, when we put God in his rightful place, when we put him in his rightful place, we experience his presence. His presence When he is on the throne, when he's on the throne of our heart, then we experience his perfect peace. We experience his presence. Get in the prayer rooms. Get into the prayer rooms where we prioritize the presence. We have them Tuesday mornings, Wednesday afternoons, and Thursday nights. That's where we get our minds like set right before him. Keep coming to church. Do not forsake the gathering of the saints. It's not for attendance numbers. It's for you to have hope in your life. When you gather with the saints and recognize that there are other people who are trying to do this life and not focus on the things of this earth and get out of the earth and get with kingdom builders. Do not forsake the gathering of kingdom builders. Get in a community group. Understand um, the word by going to a course. Go to a, a Bible study. Watch messages online. Do what you gotta do to keep your mind focused on God. You're, you're like, what? This is not specific one, two, three for how I need to treat my spouse better or relate to my kids better. I know, kingdom mindset sets everything right. When we start seeing ourselves as sons and daughters of the Most High God, when we understand who we are and that our identity is in Him, then we, are, we realize that we're a part of something greater than the things of this earth. What about my finances? What about the way I look? What about my image in front of me? What about what I'm buying so that I look good in front of all these people that I don't actually care about me? Who am I trying, who are you trying to impress? Set your minds on things above and non earthly things. Those are the things that are destroying our relationships. The things that are distracting us from loving people well. Our phones that are distracting us from keeping our presence with our kids. Our phones that are distracting us from being present with our spouses. The TV programs that are distracting us from having time with people, spending time in reality. Our video games 
Jesus, help my children. Fortnite is the enemy sometimes. <laughs> Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. That is just a reminder to me to get my kids off that. Okay, anyway, preaching to myself. Keeping seasons on lock require a kingdom mindset. Number two, it requires purification. Verse five, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. And you're like, okay, yeah, I need to do the right thing. I need to be pure in this way, this way, this way, this way. And you get rid of this, 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 and that. And you know what? Good. You, you can make a list of those things. But if you are not allowing the purification to come by way of repentance first, then you are going to be sorely disappointed. You're going to realize that you, by putting away these things, that are destroying your relationships is not going to change you. Your acceptance and reception of repentance over your life, the blessing of repentance, God's kindness leads us to repentance. If we don't allow the purification to happen by repentance first, then we're doing things backwards. We're doing things backwards. We're just kind of, I need to be purified before I can come to the presence of God. That's what a lot of people do. And, and, and now I, I think we need to start realizing that when you are a son or daughter of the king, when you are in kingdom relationship with him, trying to filter your relationships through a kingdom mindset, then you realize that you're only purified by him. And you realize that you're already a new creation. This whole section of scripture that I'm reading from, Colossians 3, 1 through um, 17, really, it's about putting on the new self. Some of us have got to say, stop saying that I am the old self. I need to stop going back there. No, you are a new self. You just have to put off the things of your old self. You are a new creation. Somebody needs to be reminded of that today. You are a new creation. When you are son and daughter of the king, you have a new label, you have a new title, you have a new authority. You just need to put it on and put off the old stuff. Put to death once and for all. That's why we have water baptism. You might be wondering, like, water baptism, oh, yeah, it's a signal. It's a place where we can really, like, you know, those people who are really bold can go tell everybody that they love Jesus. No, we actually have discovered in, through Scripture that this is a, an act of obedience to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a public declaration that we're saying that we are not going to hide our love for Jesus, and we're going to share and our love for Jesus so that he can be glorified through my life. It's, it's still, it, it's, not, it's not saying, oh, look what I've accomplished. No, when you get in the water, you put to death, you put to death what is your past and you come up a new creation. It's a symbol for what God has done internally in your life. And if it stays only internal, I'm afraid that you're gonna let this world eat you up, eat you alive. But when we make that declaration of faith and when we say that we are a new creation, Change made by God, created by God, and separated by sin, but reconciled by the love of Christ and accepting him into our lives, then we are a new creation. We love Jesus. So we're going to declare that from the rooftop, shout it from the rooftop. Okay, whatever, all these songs are stopping, getting in my head because we need to get to the place that we are building the kingdom, advancing in our relationships, put off the old self, make a declaration of faith, and encourage others so that they can also walk as new creations. If we want our relationships to change, it starts with being purified. But that doesn't come by your own strength. That goes and comes by way of faith. The great thing about faith is just it's believing. It's, it's believing in him that you are saved. It's believing in him that he can change you, that he can transform you, which leads me to my next and final point, keeping seasons on lock. You gotta be kingdom-minded. You gotta be purified. And then you have to be transformed. Listen to me. None of your relationships are going to be transformed if you don't allow God to transform your life. So again, there's an old self and there's a new self. You're raised with Christ, so start having a heavenly mindset. Verse five, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And then verse 12, put on then as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. This isn't just an issue 
of putting something to death, you've got to put something on. Put to death, be purified, but also transform and put on that new coat. Put on that new self. There is a new self that comes when you say yes to Jesus, when you oh, you say, yes, I'm gonna commit my life fully and wholly to you. Transformation, your relationships will never change if you don't transform. I'm never gonna forget, and I know we've told it from stage many times, but I remember when Caleb and I were struggling in our marriage and we went to therapy and I was like, he needs to come to therapy with me. He needs to come, he needs to come. And then the therapist said, well, I'm gonna meet weekly with Chrissy. So I needed the change. But she also knew that he wasn't ready. So she's like, maybe after she goes for a while, but I'm not gonna meet with somebody who isn't ready for change. Let me ask you this right now. Are you ready for change? Are you ready to be transformed? Are you just saying, I wanna know all the things I need to do, do, do? No, there has to be a change that happens from the inside out. And you've gotta be ready. If you wanna be delivered, you have to want to be delivered. Deliverance doesn't just come because you, you're like, oh baby, oh that's, I, do I really wanna let go of all that? Or some of us get comfortable in, our, in the old things that are holding on to our new self. You are a new creation, you are a new person, but we get, we've gotten comfortable with the past. So sometimes we just stay comfortable, but we need to put to death those things once and for all and put on the new self and get transformed. Are you willing to be transformed? Do you want your relationships to be transformed? Then it's gonna require your personal transformation. After about a year of going to therapy, Caleb said, okay, I think I'm ready. And our therapist gladly welcomed him in but it, it's not gonna happen until you want it yourself. Do you want to continue to stay stuck where you are and where your relationships have been? Jesus loves you too much. He loves you so much that he will not let you stay the same. He's gonna keep continue to reveal himself to you. He's gonna give, continue to give you an opportunity to say yes to him. He's gonna have all these opportunities for you to say yes to him. And every time you say yes to him, you say no to the old self and you have an opportunity to change, but not because, oh, not only, because of anything that you've done, but because he loves you so much, he has kindly led you to repentance and the transformation doesn't just transform you from the inside out, it transforms your relationships, it transforms your mindset, it transforms your future. The love of Christ and the freedom of Christ will transform you in your relationships. But we have to put on the new self. If then you have been right, raised with Christ, seek the things that are above and not where the Christ is seated at the right hand. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things for you have died and your life is hidden. When we are hidden, we are selfless. When we are hidden, we are humble. When we are hidden, we are emulating Jesus. When we are hidden, when we are safe under, under the shadow of his wing, then we are most like Jesus at the right hand of our Father. Do you hear me? Purification, transformation, kingdom mindset, all comes by way of knowing Jesus in every season, whether you feel like you're in a summer season, spring season, winter season, or fall season. Jesus is the same yesterday, Hebrews 13, five. Yesterday, today, and forevermore. We wanna be connected to the one that doesn't change, regardless of the season. You know, I was reading um, a book by C.S. Lewis. Did I mention this yet? C.S. Lewis, Screwtape Letters. And this is a book that was written um, in the perspective of the devil, the enemy. And he, it's pretty much a guidebook, a temptation playbook that the enemy has. And he, as a senior screw tape, or excuse me, as a senior devil or <laughs> senior demon, is counseling his nephew named Wormwood and he says, he has contrived, this is what it says about seasons, he has contrived to gratify both tastes together on the very world he has made by that union of change and permanence, which we call rhythm. 
He gives them the seasons, each season different, yet every year the same, so that spring is always felt as a novelty, yet always as a recurrence of an immemorial theme. He gives them in his church a spiritual ear. They change from fast to feast, but it is the same feast as before. The seasons that God provides is an opportunity to recognize his hand in your life. The enemy knows what season you're in, and he's gonna try to steal, kill, and destroy. So we need to stay in the season that God has provided, not want for the next and not wish for the last. We wanna know what he's doing right now. We wanna know what season he is in right now so that he can do a new thing in our life, a new thing in our heart, a new thing in our relationships, a new thing that advances and builds his kingdom. Do you wanna be a part of it? Then we gotta be connected to the one who changes us, transforms us, purifies us, Jesus the one who's the same yesterday, today, forevermore. That is who we cling to in every season. That is who we try to become like in every season. That is one, what is going to make our relationships healthy and whole. I know we're gonna talk about it in the future. It's gonna help us through our traumas and our triggers. It's gonna help us lead our lives well. It's gonna help us enjoy the fullness of the season that we're in, the single season, the fullness of the marriage season. For some of you who are trying to get out of that season, get, stay in it, oh Jesus. Marriage is stay in it. And then I want I want you to know that Jesus has something for every season. Get the fullness of what he has. If you wanna be truly satisfied, you're gonna become like him, purified by him and transformed by him. He doesn't want you to stay the same. This is the last thing I wanna share before we go. I wasn't, I said this in first service and, it, and the Lord just reminded me that the seasons of our church, for a while we were young adults, and then we all got married and all y'all are pregnant. There's tons of babies coming out, you know, natural church growth, it's amazing. But what's really cool too, is that we have seen a resurgence of some seasoned folks. Remember when we hired Pastor Randy about six, about six years ago, he just turned 68. We call him Savage Randy. <laughs> 40 years of experience in ministry. And I thank God for his life because he shows that, that we can keep going when ministry gets hard. And I wanna speak a word over the, the, the mamas and the papas of this house, that you thought that you, there was no place for you in, anymore. You thought when your children were the older years, there was nothing for them anymore. You thought that when, I'm a, when I have become an empty nester, there's nothing for God to do in and through me. Or maybe this church doesn't, doesn't value it. Can I tell you right now, we say generations are a goal, not just because of the young ones coming up, but because truly biblically, generations are everybody who are living at the same time. That's every age, every stage. So if we're gonna be a church about generations, then we're gonna see that those empty nesters are gonna be having the most impactful season of their life. The way I know my, my, my father-in-law says, that he has had the most fruitful and the most peaceful and joyful years of ministry he's ever had in his 60s. There's impact for you. There's people like me who wanna know what it took for you to stay in your faith at this age. We need to be continue to see the miracles that God has done in your life, the faithfulness that you have showed up in your life. Our church needs that every generation, every age, every stage. We need to be in relationship with those who have gone before us. We need to be pouring into the generation that is coming after us. We wanna be generations, our goal. If we wanna enjoy every season of relationship with Jesus, relationship with our loved ones, relationship with the places that God have, has, has put us in, then we're gonna be close to the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, amen? Amen, let's bow our heads in this place. If you're in this place and as I was listening, as you were listening to this message, you felt like the Lord was stirring on your heart and prompting you in your heart to dedicate your life to Him, maybe for the first time or rededicate to Him because you do want your relationships to do well. You do wanna advance the kingdom. You do wanna be a part of this mission that is bigger than yourself. You don't wanna be a selfish person any longer than you have to give yourself and your will and your ways over to the one who has created you. That's you in this place and you wanna dedicate your life to Him. You want relationship with Him again. You wanna have that renewed joy and you wanna enjoy every season that He has for you. If that's you in this place, would you raise your hand on it? Count of three. One, two, three. I see those hands. 
There are hands, 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 hands. Yep, hands, 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 hands in the back. I see it, two hands back there. Anyone else, anyone else? I wanna pray for you. All right, you can put your hands down. Would you repeat after me, everybody in this church together? Dear Jesus, I accept you in my life. Thank you for bringing me here today. I believe in you. I need you. I need you to change me, make me whole, make me clean, heal my heart, and give me the faith to live for you. I confess your son, Jesus, who died and rose again because he loved us. So I put to death myself and I put on the new self. I'm a new creation in Jesus. I love you, Lord. Give me the strength to live for you for the rest of my life. Amen. Amen.